Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Memorial Day weekend. And we're here to celebrate the ones who've gone on before us and fought the battle and <laughs> have died. And let's just yeah. honor them this weekend and the so many soldiers who've sacrificed. And we're glad you're here today to honor the Lord because we're going to see songs, we're going to give in the offering, we're going to fellowship, we're going to hear the word, and we're going to honor the fallen today. And we're just so glad you're here and uh, to celebrate with us today, so to speak. So let's ask God to bless this time and just be with us. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this blessed time you've given us today to come to your house and just celebrate your love for us, Father. We thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. And Lord, he shed his blood for our sins and he sits at the right hand of you right now, the Father, waiting to intercede for us and someday receive his church in heaven with him. And Father, I ask that you bless each life today, each person, each child, each adult, as we honor you with today's service. And we want to give you praise and we just honor you. And everybody said, Amen. 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 <laughs>
and we thank you and we acknowledge that you are holy and righteous, that you are above all. Lord, we pray that you be with our pastor, Pastor Beer. We ask that you continue to give her strength as she's going through physical rehab. We just pray that you be with her. There are many others who are recovering from surgery. We're excited to see you. Doyle here this morning, Miss Carolyn. We just pray, Lord, that you would minister to them and bless them as he's continuing to recover. We're thankful for all those who have gathered here this morning. We each come with different needs and concerns and burdens upon our heart. We just pray, O oh Holy Spirit, that you come and that you would manifest your presence, that we would see your grace work not only in our lives, but in the lives of our family, in the lives of our friends, in the lives of our place of business, dear Lord, because we want to shine your love. We want to live in your peace and in your joy. We want to show others all that you have done to us. And Lord, we are so thankful. For this is the work that only God can do. Not within our own strength. Not within our own will. Not within our own power. But by the work of the Holy Spirit. By the work of the God Almighty. Who sits in heaven and hears our prayers this morning. And Father, we come to you with humble hearts and bowed heads. Acknowledging that we need you in our homes. We need you in our families, our marriages. We need you, dear Lord, to be with our children and our grandchildren. We just ask your arms to be wrapped around us this week. What a wonderful time that we can spend with our family. That we can remember those who have sacrificed, dear Lord, so that we can have freedom. And Lord, we are so thankful that you are by our side. Lord, we come to you with our needs and our concerns, our burdens and our worries. We want to lay our anxiety on the altar this morning. As we know that we can trust you with our lives, with our present, and with our future. Lord, we thank you. We love you and we seek to build your kingdom. We pray that you bless us as a nation as we cry out to you this morning. Come, dear Lord, we pray. And in the holy and majestic name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, we pray. And the church joins together and says, Amen.
We remember and honor the soldiers who did not make it home. In front of us, you see a table set for one. It was carefully set this morning with our fallen soldiers and their families in mind. The empty chair represents an unknown face by the loss that will never be filled. The white tablecloth stands for purity of intention of the service members' motives when serving their nation. The rose represents the family who love and keep faith with the men and women who serve. The upside down glass represents those distinguished soldiers who will never be able to join in the festivities that are a part of our lives. The pinch of salt found on the plate represents the tears shed for those who died. And the lemon slice represents the bitter loss of life. The white candle represents hope. The yellow ribbon represents loyalty in waiting and for those serving away from home as we pray that they're watched over and kept close to God. The Bible is a sign of the soldier's faith in a higher power and the pledge to the country founded as one nation under God. Please join me in a moment of silent prayer for our soldiers and their families. Today is the day we put aside to remember fallen heroes and to pray that no heroes will ever have to die for us again. They chose to reject the fashionable skepticism of their time. They chose to believe and answer the call of duty. They stood for something. And we owe them something. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We must realize that no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. With God's help, we can and will resolve the problems which now confront us. And after all, why shouldn't we believe that? We are Americans. At the grave of a hero, we end not with sorrow at the inevitable loss, but with the contagion of his courage and with a kind of desperate joy we go back to the fight.
on a daily basis, those who stand in the gap, those who allow us as a nation, as a pe people, one of the core foundations that we have is that we have freedom of religion, which means that however the Holy Spirit speaks to us, however we have in this interaction with the Almighty, because His grace has reached out to us, then we can practice our faith as He has revealed Himself to us. That is a freedom that we enjoy that many parts of the world do not have. There are many governments in the world who have established a system to where you have to attend their church. You have to do it their way. They are the ones in control of the situation. To us, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because God is above all. And He has given authority to those who help us as a people to live and to build his kingdom. And for somebody to take that authority and then try to tear down his kingdom to us, it doesn't make any sense at all. We just, we just don't think in that way. One of the many responsibilities that my wife and I share is that we are co-presidents for the Oklahoma District Nazarene Missions International. And so we work with all 82 churches around the Oklahoma district, helping with their local NMI ministries and coordinating with missionaries. They're coming back from around the world and we try to have missionaries speak in our local congregations. And we do all of that. And in that role, in that responsibility, we hear many, many stories of people who are building the kingdom of God in other parts of the world who have to sacrifice their lives for the kingdom. They are martyred for their faith. And we hear the impact of that on local churches, on families, on wives and children who are left behind. And the church is doing everything that we can to help those families, to support those children, to support those women whose husbands have passed away because they were working within the kingdom of God. There are people still sacrificing their lives, even today, for the kingdom of God. And there are still men and women who are standing in the gap, even today. And that's why we remember. It's important for us to remember. Because without having that in our thought, without being reminded of that, then all of a sudden, every once in a while, we... We start to take things for granted. We start losing our appreciation for what we have and what we've been blessed with. And so this morning I want to talk about a sacrifice to remember. What the Lord has done for us. Because I would like to believe that if it is so easy to forget what Jesus has done for us, 
then I kind of think it would be easy to forget what others have done for us. But by remembering the sacrifice of Jesus on a daily basis, by remembering what God has done, sending His Son down for us, then we would be more mindful of the sacrifices of others. And I would even go to say that we would be willing to do the same. That we would be willing to live a daily life putting others and their needs in front of ours. We see that on a regular basis. We want to help our children, help our grandchildren be willing to sacrifice several things so that they can have something that we believe would help them, would benefit them. And so we make sacrifices on a regular basis for our family. And we need to continue in that same line of thinking when it comes to the kingdom of God. And so 1 Peter chapter 1, I'll be reading verses 17 through 21. Since you call on the Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. And through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So your faith and hope are in God. Amen. Our faith, our hope for eternity. How we live this life is in God. It's not in our ability. It's not in a paragraph of words that we said at some point in the past. It's not because we know better than other people or we're better than other people. Our faith and our hope is found in Jesus. In Jesus alone. So what does this verse point back to? It's kind of a weird illustration to have that Jesus was a lamb without blemish. Where does that come from? Well, the first sacrifice that we need to remember was Passover. If we go back to Exodus chapter 12, and don't worry, I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I just I kind of heard it. You know, from everybody. If you go back and take time during the week, you can go back and read the entire chapter of Exodus chapter 12 and it talks about having Passover and we're in the midst in Exodus of Moses being called out from the desert we have the burning bush Moses goes back to his people and he's talking with Pharaoh and they're in the midst of these ten plagues and so there's this battle the first thing that we think about is the battle and it wasn't a battle between Pharaoh and Moses I know you had movies and, and animated shows <laughs> talking about the struggle between Moses and Pharaoh and how they grew up in the house together and they were racing chariots as teenagers and stuff like that. Okay, so that's all kind of imagination, right? The battle was between God and the deities that Egypt worshipped. Everyone of the plagues, the ten plagues. Every one of them was to show the power of the Almighty was greater than what the deities people were worshiping. Because, you know, Egyptians, they were polytheistic. They had a, a lord or a god or an animal over everything. The river, the lifespan, God crops and moon and sun and all everything right everything had their own little god and deity and here the lord is showing he has control of all of creation now in today's culture in today's time we would kind of go well we're beyond that point we we have science 
We have technology. We know better than those people. Well, I would suggest that we're in the exact same battle today with science and technology. Because so many people worship at the altar of knowledge. And they think if they have enough knowledge and if they have enough power and if they have enough influence, they can control their life. They can control their future. They can control their situation. That nothing can come their way that they can't handle with a, a new surgery or a new medication or, or some part of philosophy or something like that. But in the end, everybody has to stand before the Almighty. Everybody will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord. So here's this battle. And illustrated, there's three days of darkness. Just, just darkness. I remember visiting a couple of caves with the families. Families. My family, right? I love you guys. Yeah, okay. We went to the caves with the family, and, and they make you walk down all the steps, and they make you go down this small tunnel. Now, I know for y'all, it's a, it's a tunnel, right? It's small. But for guys like me, it's a small tunnel. <laughs> and there are some places to where it's taking a deep breath to go any further, you know. And so they take you down to the very, very, very bottom. And they've got this cavern or this room or this space. And then the tour guide does something amazing. They say something on the order of, we're about to experience complete darkness. And they turn off the lights. Why would you do that? <laughs> I mean, you know, the kids are like, oh, Dad, hold on to me. Stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, hold on to me. <laughs> you can't see anything. Well, in Egypt, for three days, utter darkness. But they had great temples and they had huge statues to raw the God of the Son. So this is a battle between the Almighty saying, who do you think has control over the light? God does. And the deity that they worship more than any other, the deity that they thought was number one was the deity that they could see in Pharaoh. They thought Pharaoh was the son of God. He was God manifested in human form. And so they're going to worship Pharaoh. He had ultimate control over life and death in Egypt. He was the law. And Moses stood before him and said, let my people go. We're going to take all of our men and women, our children and our animals, and we're going to go out into the desert and we're going to worship. <laughs> we're going to worship our God, the feet of Pharaoh. And he grew up his entire life being told, hey, you're God. That gets to people. That gets in their head. And he didn't like it. And so ultimately there was the tent play. And the Lord said, there's going to come an angel of death. And we're going to see who has power over life and death. It wasn't a Pharaoh who spoke to soldiers who carried swords and spears. But it was the angel of death. And the only way to have the angel of death pass over your house was to have a sacrifice of a one-year lamb and to spread its blood on the doorpost. You see, there was a sacrifice made. You had to make a choice. Are you willing to give up a little animal or are you willing to let the firstborn of the house die? Now, as a second child, I would debate. Well, let me think about it. As an oldest child, I'm sure my brother would say, not a contest. All right? There, there's sacrifices. We have to make a decision. We have a choice to make. We can go either A or B. We can choose this direction or go that direction. We're going to have to make a sacrifice. And so the families who have lived for the last 400 years in slavery and oppression 
There was no question. There was no discussion. They're going to follow the word of God to the letter. And so the door frames, the door posts, the blood of the Lamb. And with sacrifice, whether we like it or not, many times requires bloodshed. What are we willing to give up? What are we willing to pay the price for? And so there was blood that was shed. But we, we have it easy, don't we? In our culture of convenience, I've heard crazy things from people in our culture. People have said, you know, we shouldn't kill animals anymore. We should just go to the grocery store and get meat. <laughs> no, that's not how it works. So we have this level of separation, right? I mean, it's not like we're going out for a Sunday lunch and grabbing the closest chicken and wringing its neck and, you know, plucking it and getting it prepared. We don't do that anymore. We go to the grocery store, we get it. And if we're really looking for convenience, it's already cooked. Right? We just take it home and eat it. We're, we're disconnected. But to have that sacrifice just really impact your life directly makes you pause and wonder. I'm not sure how else the Lord can do it. But maybe we need to change some of our perspective. But I believe the Lord brings us here on a weekly basis for a reason and for a purpose. Not only for our benefit, because we need to be renewed with a fellowship from fellow believers. But we come here on a weekly basis to be reminded of all that the Lord has done for us. The way that He has blessed us, the way that He has kept us. But more and more, we need to be reminded of the sacrifice that has been given for us. That we can live a life for the Lord. Because it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus. And we need to remember. In Exodus chapter 13 that we've been referring to, it sets up the Passover feast. And every year since this Exodus event, the Jewish people have remembered Passover. And for several thousands of years, they were participating in that up until the time of Jesus. And when Jesus takes that message, when Jesus takes all of those stories, when he takes all of those images, and he reveals that he has come as a fulfillment of the law. You see, Jesus doesn't do away with the Old Testament. We still believe in the Old Testament. We still read the Old Testament. We still follow the Old Testament with the understanding that we're no longer under the law, but we live in grace. But that doesn't mean we avoid all the Old Testament. It's the foundation on which our faith is built. And so every year the story is told again, Passover. The story is told again, and it's passed on. And then now as Christians, every year we celebrate Easter. Why? Because we need to be reminded. There's remembrance that takes place. Reminded of all that Jesus has done for us. And so a lamb without blemish. So if we, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, but with the precious blood of Jesus... A lamb without blemish or defect. He is the fulfillment of all that that image was. Exodus 13, Exodus 12, 11, 12, 13, that area. So there is a battle earlier between God and the deities of Egypt. But with the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, there's another battle. It's the battle of the Almighty against the forces of Satan. The devil himself. During that last supper, Jesus is talking to the disciples. He washes their feet. He gives an example of what a servant to others means. That's what leadership is. Servant leadership, helping others. 
they're eating a meal and he tells them, you know, eventually someone's going to betray me. And then you have 12 guys go, huh? It's not going to be me, Lord, is it? It's not going to be me. It's not going to be me. Blah, blah, blah. And then Peter makes this bold statement. We love Peter. Peter, he's a bold guy. Doesn't always make the right choice, but you know, at least he's bold about it. He goes up and he tells Jesus, even if all these guys deny you, I will never deny you. And Jesus says, Satan is trying to shift you, to test you. And before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Peter's like, no, 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 that won't happen. You see, there's this battle for our soul. And one of the lies Satan uses in our world today is that he doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. It's just stories. It's just myth. Now with that deception comes this stealth attack. Because if he doesn't exist, you don't need to defend against him. See, but there's a battle between the Almighty and Satan. But it's not an equal battle, is it? No. There, there's no balance between good and evil. There's no 50-50 between light and dark. Because light wins every time. Every single time when you turn on the light switch, and the light comes on, right? And the light comes on. <laughs> Can't get there. The room now has light. Never at one point when the candle is lit is the room completely dark. Why? Because one little flame can defeat a room of darkness. There is no balance. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, after sin has entered the world, and the Lord is talking to the serpent. He says, there will be enmity between you and the seed of the woman. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Does Jesus die on the cross? Yes. But on the third day he rose. And that's the ultimate victory. Resurrected power. Death is defeated. The grave has lost its sting. Folks, this life is not the end. There is an eternity with heaven and in the presence of the Almighty. That's the eternity. Almighty God Himself. Being in His presence. Serving Him. Worshiping Him. There's no illness. There's no sickness. There's no goodbyes. We're going to be in the presence of of Jesus Christ, our King. So there is this battle. Do not be fooled. Do not have the mistaken idea that that battle isn't waged over your heart and soul. It is. Because Satan goes around as a roaring lion seeking to who he can devour and steal. We have to stand guard against that. Because there's a battle being waged for us. There's also bloodshed. <coughs> the bloodshed. The bloodshed of Jesus that covers our heart saves us. Many people throughout the years have asked the question of why did Jesus have to die? I mean, what, what was the reason? What was the purpose? Couldn't he just say, everybody's forgiven? Why, why did he have to go through the cross? Because there is an eternal debt, the sin that separates God from humanity, that can only be bridged by one who is eternal. By being a, a creature, a creation, by being an individual. I can never repay my debt. But Jesus did. Jesus shed his blood. So that my sins can be forgiven. 
that now I can have a relationship with the Almighty. And, and that doesn't make sense. Why, why would the Eternal One sacrifice His life so that somebody who is a creation can spend eternity with the Father? And the only word I can come up with is love. Is love. God loves you. God loves you. And that's why He died on the cross. And just as the door frames were painted with blood, our hearts have to be covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. We just have to accept and believe this gift and say that the blood of Jesus is our only hope for the future. That's our hope. So we have this battle and this bloodshed and there is the sacrifice because the sacrifice of Jesus leads to freedom. Is there a pain? Is there a burden? Is there an addiction? Is there something holding you back? Is there something that just for whatever reason, it just has a grip on your heart and your soul? And what you're looking for is freedom. And it's different for everybody. Everybody has their different likes, dislikes. Everybody has their different personalities. My issue is going to be different from your issues. Why? Because we're different people. There are things that I've never even tried. It, it, it's not even a temptation. I don't understand it, why people would participate in those things. But I got my own issues. Thank you very much. My own problems. Shortcomings. Failures. You should see my paperwork at my house. It's awful. Terrible. So we all have our own issues. But Christ comes to save us. And his sacrifice brings us freedom. Which means I don't have to live in the gutter of life. I don't have to be bound by those addictions. I don't have to live framed with a voice telling me of all my failures. I can live and I can stand and I can have the power of the Almighty living through me. Why? Because Jesus brings me freedom. We are a holiness people. Not to make us better, but to say, I don't have to live in the gutter of life. I can live a better life. Why? Because that's what God wants for me. That's what He has designed for me. To live life to the fullest. Not bound by what the world says we have to do. Following God. And the way I have that freedom, the way I break those chains, the way I, I shake off those shackles, is with the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit. So there's this remembrance. At the Passover, but with Jesus Christ, we have the remembrance. The Lord gave us three things to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Three things. First is the cross. The cross. That's where Jesus died. That's where the battle was fought. And folks, Jesus wasn't tricked to go to the cross. The Jews didn't make him go to the cross. The Roman soldiers didn't force Jesus to go to the cross. It wasn't by trickery. It wasn't by deceit. It wasn't by military force. The only thing that took Jesus to the cross was his love for you. The Jews weren't smarter than Jesus. The Romans weren't more powerful than Jesus. The only reason he went to the cross is because he died for your sins. That's why he went to the cross. And in our faith... And in our belief, the cross is vacant because the price has already been paid. That's the first thing the Lord gives us to remember. The second thing is the empty tomb. Guess what? Jesus is alive and well. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding on your behalf. The 
tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Every other philosophy out there, every other idea out there, guess what? They go to the tomb and worship where that guy's buried. They make tricks to worship something around the bone or whatever. It means he's dead. <laughs> Jesus is alive. And the other thing the Lord gives us is the Last Supper. The cross, the empty tomb, and the Lord's Supper. If we turn to Luke chapter 22, we see Jesus in the Last Supper. He took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for you. He gave us the Last Supper. A sacrifice to remember. It's the sacrifice of Jesus. Those three things remind us that Christ's love overcomes and fulfills the law. Grace is over the law. The empty tomb reminds us that Jesus is alive. My family and I, a couple years ago, it's probably three years ago now, we went to Washington, D.C. It was kind of a family vacation and stuff. Yeah? And we did all the major sites. You know, we went up to Washington Monument and looked out little windows. And uh, we went to the Arlington National Cemetery. And there we saw the 3rd Infantry stand guard over the tomb of the unknown soldier. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. The 3rd Infantry is there standing guard. What an honor. Because they're remembering those who have fought. We are reminded that Jesus died for our sins, <laughs> but he rose again. See, his tomb is empty. We're reminded of that. And that's why the remembrance is so important. If it's any wonder that we live in a culture that, for, that has forgotten the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, people will forget the sacrifice of others. And so we stand today to remember those who have fallen. But we are here today to worship the one who is risen. We're here to worship God. We're here to be in his presence. A closing thought before we move into a time of prayer. The battle has been won. The blood has been shed. The lamb has been sacrificed. The cross is vacant. The tomb is empty. Jesus is king. And our lives need to be a living memorial. Our lives need to be a living memorial. Would you stand with me please this morning? I want to take time this morning to open up the altars. If the Lord is speaking to you through this message, I want to give you the opportunity to respond. This is a sacrifice to remember. A time that we remember what the Lord has done for us. If you'd like to come to the altar, I encourage you to do so as we close in a time of prayer. There's a sacrifice to remember of the Passover. When the angel of death came. And the families that were spared were the ones who had blood on the door posts and the threshold. Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. He died on the cross. And we can have eternal life when his blood covers our heart. And do you know him as your Lord and Savior? Is he God? Is he king of your life? Let us go and worship him this morning. Would you pray with me please this morning? Father in heaven, we remember those who have fallen so that we can have the freedom of being here this morning. We pray to the Lord that you would minister to the families of those who have lost loved ones. We pray to the Lord that you would be with them 
encourage them during this weekend. But Lord, we are reminded of the ultimate sacrifice given by Jesus, your Son, who went to the cross to die for us. Lord, it's beyond our understanding, it's beyond our comprehension, other than the word of love, that your gift of Jesus was one of love. Father, we pray that you minister to our hearts and our souls this morning, as a people, as a church, as a congregation. We just pray for an anointing of the Holy Spirit, that we can live life an example to others. In this we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our risen Savior. And the church joins together.